Thank you, uh, Rhonda, for the introduction, and welcome everybody to Suicide Prevention Week. I, I think it's marvelous that the Brockville General Hospital uh, and Mental Health Services has been able to organize and sponsor events like this because I think education and information is power, and the more information people have, the more equipped they are to help people and to help themselves. So what we're going to be talking about today is uh, self-injury, essentially, um, rather than suicide in particular, because what we do know about self-injury is it can sometimes lead to um, suicide or it could lead to accidental death as well. So we're going to talk about what self-injury is, uh, what motivates people and what, what are some of the driving forces that lead people to think about harming themselves and then what we can do about that, both as people uh, who self-injure and for people who are trying to help and support uh, family members and loved ones who, who hurt themselves. So that's pretty much the agenda for this presentation. And um, if at any point in time you have questions, feel free to ask and uh, I'll be happy to answer to the best of my ability. And so if I'm not able to, I can certainly um, let you know where, where, you can, where I can find out and pass on information to you. Having said that, you have a handout there. And um, so feel free to refer to that. If there are any ideas that come to you that you think may be helpful, certainly jot them down. And towards the end of the presentation, I'll be offering some specific things that you could do to, to help yourself or other people, okay? So let's begin then. So in, in our technical field, when we talk about self-injury, we are really referring to what we call parasuicide. So parasuicide meaning it's an, it's an in, in, intent to hurt oneself, but without the intent to kill or to, to die. So it usually, it usually leads to uh, some, a non-fatal outcome. It does, cause, it does break the skin and it does cause physical damage, but remember that the intention is not to, to, to um, kill themselves or to end one's life. And unless there's some kind of intervention, usually this behavior continues. Um, and the, what's really helpful to know about self-injury is that there are certain consequences that come about. It's either to change someone's emotional, mental state within, or a physiological, a bodily state within, or to change some kind of social uh, relationship, some dynamic within your social relationship. So. Uh, no, knowing that can be helpful because then we can look at what are the things we can do to help the person uh, turn to some other things rather than uh, things that would harm themselves. So remember that it's, it's, it's non-fatal, the intention is not to, to end one's life, and the, the, the purpose is to change something about themselves how, in terms of how they feel, how they think, uh, uh, and something about the social relationship. Okay. So, and, and to distinguish, given that this is a suicide prevention week, I like to distinguish parasuicide from suicide, meaning that suicide, compared to parasuicide, the intention is to inflict harm so that, so that the person no longer um, is alive and, and, and dies. And then, of course, it's what we call, what we all know as suicide attempts, is when the person puts himself or herself at risk but does not complete the act. So someone may um, overdose but didn't take enough or someone may go to um, the bridge and look down, and then someone intervenes and, and stops that from happening. Um, so there are different attempts that, ways that people will attempt suicide. Um, and then there's, what, then, then there's the threat of suicide, meaning the person actually says and expresses an intent to kill himself or herself, but has yet to act on it. So, and then finally, there's, there's suicidal ideation, and that's when people just think about it. So oftentimes, people start with some, some, some thoughts and about around suicide and wanting to end one's life, and as they progress further, um, it, it's more and more uh, dangerous, and the person is more and more at risk for, for killing themselves. Uh, later on in the week, there, is, there are other presentations around how you can um, know what the signs are and what you can do in terms of suicide risk. But certainly, if you look at this sequence, um, going from suicide attempt to uh, ideation to suicide attempt, those are really markers, things that you want to watch out for, um, for uh, making sure that the person is safe. Right. So again, parasuicide is very different from suicide and that the intent is not to harm themselves. What do we see out there in terms of the patterns of, of parasuicide? Usually the onset is between the ages of 10 and 16, and more commonly seen among women. The, and if you look at uh, the group of people who harm themselves, there is a, there are a, a large number of them who have some kind of sexual trauma, childhood abuse. 
and it's interesting how that can translate into how they cope with whatever is happening, the memories, the flashbacks, and all of that. The, the, what we also find is that they, make, they come from an environment in which the family has not, been very, has not been very supportive of emotions, or have not been very validating of emotions. So they, they may receive messages like, oh, don't feel like that, you're, being, you're silly for feeling like that. Or if they're crying, or if you're, you cry now, I'll give you something to cry about. So, or they, they are not allowed to express how they truly feel. So, and, and when, when kids are brought up not to have room for emotions or know how to express and cope with feelings, then sometimes they avert to more destructive ways in desperation almost to, to tell people how they truly feel. So when, when people come from an, a family environment where it's, their, their feelings and emotions are invalidated or discouraged or put down or minimized or punished, you know, some kids get punished for, for being angry, right? Uh, so th that then they don't learn how to manage feelings that, that come to them. And um, we find that sexual abuse survivors uh, tend to commit more medically serious parasuicidal acts than non-survivors. Oftentimes, you also find that there are substance abuse problems, eating disorder uh, challenges, and obsessive-compulsive perfectionistic uh, 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 patterns as well. And uh, they may often be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And within this group of people who have been diagnosed with borderline personality, six, about 70 to 80 percent of them uh, injure themselves, harm themselves. And 8, eight to 12 percent of those who commit the suicide also, if you look at their histories, have a history of self-injury. And they're more twice as likely to, in the end, um, end their lives. Yes? Can you clarify borderline personality? I will do that um, when I go into the next slide. Right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> The, I, I, within the DSM-5 now, there are specific um, criteria and things to look out for. But um, I will go through some of those characteristics in turn. All right. Thank you for that question. Okay. So, uh, any other questions so far? Okay. So, just for us to get some appreciation for what it is like to, for, for someone who harms himself or herself, my question to, to you and um, is, you know, when you are in a lot of stress or distress, what do you do to cope? You know, I know what mine is. I call it retail therapy. <laughs> what a place to have this presentation. Oh, uh, that's easy for me. I have a nice strong cup of tea ah. and uh, lemon biscotti. Okay, so you have a, a, a way of coping that soothes <laughs> you, right? Um, that's great. Are there other ways of coping? You know? Scrabble by you, myself. You play Scrabble? All oh, right, but perfect. It just takes my mind off, off something. So you, you, that, that Scrabble helps because it takes your mind off something. Yeah. And uh, you've had some really uh, healthy ways of coping yeah. with things, right? But I also overeat. You overeat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That can happen too. So I might play Scrabble and eat cookies or something. At the same Comfort time. food. You <laughs> overeat. Yeah, yeah. And, and some ways are more damaging than others. Like my retail therapy. Um, most of the time, I can afford it, right? So, and I don't overspend, I'm just watchful. But you know, we all have ways to cope, some of which are more damaging than others, right? Some people will yell at people, will scream and yell, right? Some people will drink. Um, some people will um, um, do other destructive things that, that will add to their problems. So, you know, imagine what it's like for, for us, you know, uh, when we are really, really upset and, and stressed out. We've had the kind of upbringing, perhaps, that allow us to think of healthy ways and, and non-destructive ways. Whereas other people, in, in terms of intense, intense, high emotional intent, uh, experience, they may not be able to think as, as, as clearly or to have learned ways to you know, do something else rather than to harm themselves. So there are different ways that people harm themselves, right? The, the more classic be behaviors are things like cutting, burning, branding, marking, picking at the skin, reopening old wounds, you know, so they, they have had a cut, they will pick at it, to, uh, hair pulling, hitting, biting, bone breaking, head banging. Um, so, you know, so some of which are certainly m m more severe than others, but here is the range. Now, I'm extending this definition of self injury somewhat to substance abuse, to eating disorder, and sexual risk taking. Because although there are other motivators involved, the end result, the, the, the reason why people engage in substance abuse, eating disorders, and sexual risk taking, the reasons are fairly similar to people who injure themselves. So uh, there are all kinds of ways that we can 
you know, harm ourselves. Uh, and here are some reasons why people tend to cut themselves, burn themselves, bang their heads, pick at their, their wounds and all that. Uh, a, a big reason is that it brings about a relief in anxiety, tension, anguish. You know, I've had people describe to me, they feel so, so frustrated, it's all held up in the body. And when they cut themselves, it's like, oh. So it's a real release of whatever that has, has been pent up and built up inside. So it's, it, it, and imagine what it's like when we have relief from fear, when we are so afraid and we have found some way to get some, some, a break from our, 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 this, this strong fear, especially, you know, think about people who have had history of abuse, right? They they've oftentimes feel afraid from the flashbacks and all that. So when they cut themselves, it just gives them a sense of release and relief. It's sometimes a way of expressing anger and aggression, either towards um, other people in giving them the message, or they're so angry with themselves that they need to punish themselves. Uh, uh, certainly, I've had people who have felt so much shame and guilt and self-blame for what happened. The only way they, they have release from that temporarily is to slash themselves. So that's another reason. It's, on the other side, some people feel so numb, a sense of emptiness. In order to feel alive again, I have to, do, I have to introduce such an intense sensation to make me come alive, to get away from this sense of numbness and, and emptiness. So, you know, um, so that's another purpose for, for self-harm. Regaining a sense of control. People who've been abused are people who've had control taken away from them. You know, someone has used their bodies for their own benefit. So they, 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 they have this uh, sense that if I hurt myself, I'm the only one who can hurt myself now. I, I'm in charge of my body. No one else can take control over my body. So, and we all know how important that is to have a sense of control. Punishing self, I mentioned that earlier on, you know, to, to get away from guilt and shame is to punish themselves. Um, this euphoria, you know, when we hurt ourselves, um, there, there is a, a chemical that gets released that makes people feel good. And I've heard that from, from clients as well. They like the sense of the warmth of that blood and they feel an, a, a, a little bit of a high from doing that. Um, so it, it can have um, sort of an addictive component as well, if that's the, if that's the experience and the, and the reason. And then, like I said, Self-harm has a communicative element. It's a, a way to tell people how distressed they are, how upset they are. And, and, it's also, and in so doing, it influences others covertly. And this is where we get into how people describe people who harm themselves as being manipulative. You know, they're being manipulative. In a sense, it's true, but not in a... Uh, not in a way that, that whose intent is to get you to be so upset. It's really they, they don't know how else to, to do things to get the effect that they want. So we often are not very, we get really frustrated by people who harm themselves or whom we call borderline, who have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder because they are sort of manipulative and difficult. Uh, because it, it is hard, it's, it's really challenging for family members to have to deal with this too. But to call um, them manipulative in a very derogatory way or judgmental way doesn't help. Uh, so it helps to understand where they're coming from, that in fact they are trying to manipulate something, but they're not being very effective in that. They're not getting the results that will help them to um, move on or to help them to heal. So, uh, and, and so it's really, I think, my intent for this presentation is also is a big part of it is to help us understand that experience of why people harm themselves so that we can be more compassionate and understanding because that's really important if, uh, in helping uh, that so really when we look at the what we look at self harm it's really ways for them to cope that people who harm themselves are trying so desperately to find coping strategies to find something that will help them deal with the anxiety deal with their fear get relationships that they want um, to be able to tolerate whatever distress they are under it, it, they're really desperate to find something uh, and so to your question about what we mean by borderline personality disorder here are some of the um, not all but some of the characteristics of people who harm themselves there is this chronic negative feeling. They just feel, ugh, I like to generally use the word yucky. They just feel so bad and so down about, on themselves a lot of the time. And, and the, 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 uh, the negative feelings 
one of the predominant ones is anger. We see very common in people who, who harm themselves. There's so much anger and rage, hostility, irritability. And we find that their relationships are very conflictual. Sometimes they'll um, feel really close to you and they want to be close to you and they want to have this wonderful relationship with you. But then if I get too close to you, they feel really afraid that you are going to abandon them and reject them. So they're going to get angry to push you away or to distance themselves from this relationship. And, and then when they get too distant, they feel, oh, I don't like this, I feel too alone. So they try to do things to come back and sort of uh, apologize and say sorry till they get too afraid again and then they'll do something to push it. So you can imagine how in, with your loved ones, sometimes you, they'll feel, oh, everything is going really nicely. And then the next day, what's going on? You know, it was very different before. And again, it's their own way of trying to cope with their fears of abandonment and rejection. So the, the relationships get to be very conflictual. And the social, social support tends to be weak as well. Partially, sometimes they lose the social support because people get frustrated and angry with them. Uh, and partially, they may be afraid to reach out to people too. So they don't have a strong support network. Interpersonal problems are paramount. Um, you can imagine how, how much uh, um, turmoil can be created in relationships when uh, the self-harm is there. Um, it makes people around them feel guilty, helpless, powerless. Less. So sometimes people don't uh, want to hang around too much because it's not very pleasant or enjoyable to be around. Uh, pass they tend to be very passive in terms of problem solving when there are interpersonal conflicts, not very assertive. The, the alcohol and drug abuse is uh, common, multiple sexual partners, and very black and white thinking. It's another common experience I find. And that's why it's so hard for, for people to shift perspectives because they're so certain, they go from one extreme, either this or that. It helps them understand their experiences better. Like most of us, you know, it's much easier when we see things in this way or that way. None of this gray stuff is just too confusing, you know. Uh, but that's not reality, like life is such that things are not as not simple. And then low self-esteem, low self-esteem. The, the, um, Added thing about people diagnosed with borderline personality together with the, the label affect, interpersonal problems. It's also, uh, the parasuicide is another characteristic, this behavioral the, the dysregulation with their behaviors they can't control, they can be impulsive. And the sense of self, there's, they, they, have an, a, they don't have a sense of who they are or they could see themselves as being void. There's a big hole, um, an emptiness within is another characteristic of uh, someone with a borderline personality uh, pattern and uh, cognitive rigidity as well. So I hope I get, get painted you a, a picture like that. Um, okay, so any questions so far? No? I hope this resonates somewhat with you. All right, so let me go into the practical parts now. Okay, so now many of our clients or, or people who, who, who injure themselves, they have a lot of inter, they have interpersonal problems, they may have financial problems, they may have um, um, school problems, work problems, all kinds of problems that are out there. When we have a problem, there are only four solutions that, or four options that we have. And here are the four options. And I'm drawing, this is from dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, so the, the first, the first uh, best option is to solve the problem. Because once we solve the problem, the problem is gone. So take for example, I'm on the way to the airport and I have a fl flight to catch and I'm really, really late already. And I have a flat tire. So I have a problem, right? My problem is I need to get to the airport in time and now I have a flat tire. So what, what my first option, for option is to solve the problem. So what would be a solution to that? Changing my tire, okay. Perfect. Now let's say I open up my hood and I notice, oh, someone took my jack. So I still have the problem. So what's my next solution to the problem? Phone CAA. Phone CAA. Perfect. So I call CAA and um, they say, oh, yeah, we are on our way, but it'll take about 30 minutes to get there because you're out in the country and this and that. So, so I've done that. So while I'm waiting for the problem to be solved, I have to... I, I, want to uh, f not suffer so much. I, I want to get rid of this oh, uh, angst and, and, and upsetness that I'm going to be late. So I have to figure out how, what else I can do. So number two is the other option, to feel better about the problem. So I have to find a way to look at this problem while I still have the problem to feel differently about it. 
OK, so I'm still going. Now, uh, I'd rather not be doing this. So how can I look at the situation differently so that I can feel less anxious, annoyed, angry, irritated by it? Um, one way would be, well, you know, I've always been somebody who's not been very patient. Maybe this is a way for me to learn how to be patient. So I'm getting a, di a meaning from the situation so that I, I, I'm not so upset and distressed. Right? So uh, that's an example of feeling better about a problem. I still have the problem, but at least I can sort of uh, chill out a little bit. Okay. <laughs> then there is the third option. The third option is to accept and tolerate the problem. And what I mean by accepting is that it is what it is. Right? There's nothing I can do about it right now. It is what it is. No amount of protesting and saying, this shouldn't happen, this shouldn't happen, it's going to change the situation. You're smiling, so I'm assuming we've all been there. Right? Uh, so, so this is really important, to accept and tolerate the problem. Meaning I still have the problem, but I have to need to find some way to get me through the time till, um, till, till, till CA gets there. Otherwise, I'll suffer and be upset. So what are, the way, what are the things I could do while I'm waiting for, in the country, waiting for CA to come, to help me get through these moments? Listening to music on the radio. Mm -hmm. Any other things? Read a book. Read a book. I've had a book, yes. Um, play games on... On the phone, right? Any others you can think of? Imagine yourself out in the country. Yeah. Go for a walk. Just walk, yes. If it's a nice day and uh, nice flowers, look at flowers if that's what you're into, right? So the great examples of what you can do to get you through those things without making it worse. That's the important thing about this. Accepting tolerated problem, to not do anything to make it worse. Because oftentimes our solutions, our the things that we try to, to do, we, the things we do to try to solve the problem or get us through the moment makes it worse. Self harm is a way is an example of how uh, uh, people uh, are doing things to get uh, away from anxiety, anger, but they've added another problem. So if I've cut myself, I not only have the injury to deal with now. I have to all the people mad at me. I have to go to the hospital. And people may, uh, may give me a hard time for cutting myself yet again. And then I have the pain of getting sutured and, you know, all the fallout from that. So uh, tolerating the problem means accepting it for what it is and not doing anything to make it worse. And that's not an easy thing to do if you don't have enough ideas and strategies and techniques for it. If we, if we do not do any of the three, I, the person stays miserable. So I can choose to stay miserable by, while waiting for CA to come, or I can make the moment as, as, as best as I can so that I don't suffer as much. I hmm? always accept and tolerate first and then go about trying to solve. Well, that, if that helps you get to that, for sure. Because sometimes we, we need to do this in order to solve the problem, to calm ourselves down. Because when we are too distressed, it's hard to come up with a solution, right? So it's helpful to do that, absolutely. But just know that if you don't solve the problem, uh, the problem remains. So what we have here to reinforce this idea of acceptance is that when we suffer, there are two components to suffering. There is the pain itself, the emotional pain, the physical pain, and the non-acceptance of the pain that we, we are saying that I should not be feeling like this. So imagine a person who has, you've, imagine you've lost a loved one and uh, you're not, you feel the emotional pain of loss, the grief. But if you don't accept that this grief is there, you, we are suffering twice because we are saying, oh, this shouldn't happen, this shouldn't, shouldn't happen. But we cannot fight reality. Reality is what it is. So when we can accept things, the pain that's there, the anguish, the anxiety, the fear, whatever it may be, then we can just, all we have left with the suffering is just the pain. Make sense? So th what I'm going to uh, offer you and, and in terms of what people can do and what you can do to help people is what we call distress to tolerance skills. So here's the practical part. So these are all the ways that you can help your loved ones or if you have um, urges like that, these are all the things you can do. Uh, so the first thing is what we call distraction strategies. So to, to find ways to distract yourself through activities. So do something, right? Uh, my, in my, in the, my case of the... the, the uh, getting stuck with a flat tire is to um, put my mind onto games. Right. Do something engaging that will take you, that will draw your mind into that activity. Um, other things could be playing Scrabble. Um, some people walk, but preferably something vigorous. So get, get in, active in something. Contributing. Contributing is to think about how I, could, I can do something to help others. So for those people who enjoy helping people, 
you could think about ways that uh, you could do something, make something for someone, how you could help others as, as a way to contribute to people. The, or even thinking about a nice thing you could do for someone. That's harder when you're all upset. But you know, if, if you have this people who, have, uh, who tend to be caretakers, can use this strategy as well. Comparisons. This is a tricky one. You, know, you may want to think about other people in, in, in a worse situation. Sometimes that makes people feel worse because they feel guilty. But for some people, it helps to think about, uh, you know, uh, take a broader perspective that, yeah, it's really, really bad now, but it could be worse. It could be worse. Um, um, there's a suggestion in, in, in DBT, watch soap operas. <laughs> Say, so, oh my God, I'm suffering. Look at them, right? With all the uh, emotional turmoil. Uh, emotions, and that brings me to emotions. Watch something funny, right? Introduce a feeling that's different from what you're feeling. If you're feeling angry, or uh, watch a comedy, a funny movie. Again, it's also a distraction from, as an activity, but do something that will bring up a different feeling in you. Um, read emotional books, you know, that bring up different feelings. You know, um, look at um, things in your possession that will bring up the, the sense that you're, you're cared for. Re little reminders like that. Pushing away, pushing away just in your mind temporarily, uh, leaving it for a while, putting it on the shelf. Uh, so, for example, uh, people. People who are in, uh, uh, going through a flashback, I'll, I'll, you, one can learn the skill of teaching the person to see those flashbacks on the wall there and putting all those images into a film, into a video or something. Um, now with social media, I'm not sure what you call it, but just wrap it up nicely in a little package and then putting it on a shelf. So just a mental way of pushing away whatever is the, the turmoil, the source of the turmoil. And all, you could also leave the situation as well. And then with other thoughts, we've always heard this, count to 10, count to 10. Um, use imagery in your mind to put other things in there. And, and sensations, uh, introduce other sensations in your body. So holding ice, right? Holding ice can be till it melts because the ice, there's a painful sensation in there, but it doesn't break the skin. So hold it till it, it melts. Okay. Um, another useful thing is splash your face with icy cold water for about um, uh, 30 to 40 seconds because that makes... Have you ever put your face in cold water? Yes. Icy, and what does that do to you? It's sharp. sharp, right? <gasps> that will get people out of anxiety. Right? So we call it uh, the dive reflex, you know, where people go underwater and they oh, So it changes things. And of course, the cold sensation will, will do something physiologically. So th th that's, those are uh, strategies that target sensations. And then there's another group of strat strategies called self-soothing strategies, using our senses of what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, and what we touch. So uh, I... I Given my work, I like to see beautiful things because, you know, I hear of people suffering. So it's helpful. That's why I think where retail therapy comes in, you know, go to home sense, look at nice things, right? Uh, go into nature, look at what's beautiful out there through my eyes. Um, look, um, light a candle. So you have something that, that can be quite soothing as well. Uh, hearing, use your sense of hearing. Music that you had mentioned, you know, uh, relaxing music. You have all kinds of uh, sound, what do you call it, sound uh, machines. You know, have that as well. Let your ears hear something different, especially, uh, many, especially when it is the flashbacks that are making people feel so afraid that they want to harm themselves. We are introducing not, not what they remember, not what they saw, not what they heard, not what they felt, not what they sensed that been so traumatizing. We are introducing new sensations, pleasant sensations, soothing sensations. So we're doing something to the brain rather than just the old stuff, memories, we're introducing new sensations to alter the old ones through our senses. Smell, candles, right? aromatherapy candles, um, baking, yeah, baking, right? It, just as, it's so, it can be very powerful, right? It just changes your whole, whole sense of being. Any other ideas of a smell? That's helpful. Mm. Mm. Nature. 
nature. Oh yeah, nature has a sound. Yes, yes. And, and some people have, are so in touch with the, the earth that when they smell the earth, they feel really grounded. So smelling is another thing. Taste. Uh, chocolate, yes. That can be soothing. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Uh, different things that are very soothing for you in terms of you know, using your, your, the, the taste. Again, it's to change your, the, the brain's recording of the old, of the memory that come from the uh, past trauma. We are introducing something in the present to alter that, your taste. And touch, wrapping a warm blanket um, around you, um, fleecy blankets, right? Having a w warm bath, right? That can be helpful. Hugging, what's that? Hugging. Hugging your dog, yes. The sensation, the sensorial thing, right? Your skin feels something different. Rather than someone hurting you, your body and your brain is now registering, oh, this is healing, this is soothing. So, uh, so these are the self-soothing uh, techniques. And then we have, in the moment of oh, utter anguish, use imagery. Come up with, bring up an image of someone who's been very compassionate and, and kind towards you. You know, it could be a teacher, a grandparent, um, a friend, just, or, or even a, a deity, you know, whoever that may be, or the universe, the earth can also change the, the, the distress through imagery. Find meaning in it. What's the meaning for this suffering? Right. And for those people, for if you are spiritual and or religious, prayer can be helpful. You know, help me through this, deliver me from this, um, get me through this. Again, it's just to, to get through the moment. It's not to solve the problem. It's just to help, you get, help people get through the, the moment without harming themselves. It's all about just getting through because it will pass. It will pass. Relaxation. So do muscle relaxation, breathing exercises, body scan. And, and if you uh, Google some of these words like body scan, you'll get, you'll get uh, different websites that can guide you through. Uh, these strategies. One thing at a time, focusing on what do I have to get through right now, right this minute, right this second. I just have to get through this breath. I just and draw one's entire attention to right this minute, not what's down the road, but just let me get through this. You know? And I, this is no comparison to the distress uh, of, for people, of people who harm themselves, but for, for me, one thing at the moment has been my saving grace whenever, whenever there's been stress. So I go into the office, there are tons to do. If the attention is like, get me through, just have to do this thing, just write this letter, or just write this, or just return this phone call. It makes the day go a little bit easier. Rather than me getting so irritated by people um, and um, um, you know, take it out on others. So need to, these are just ways to calm oneself down. Go on a vacation, whether for real or in one's mind. Imagine yourself in a soothing, quiet place. Take yourself away in a men as a mental vacation. And encouragement, be your own cheerleader. You know, I, I got through this. I can do this. You know, a lot of self-talk to encourage yourself. Mm -hmm. And then evaluating the pros and cons. Think about the consequences of, of changing and not changing the 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 pro the risk the benefits and the negative consequences of har of harming oneself you know it's, it's really an intellectual exercise to what are the costs of this and when we stop to evaluate the pros and cons it brings about a pause rather than having the urge to do it right away by having to think through wait 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 let me think about what is going to happen if i did this and what happens if i don't do this right. so just to go through this process of looking at the pros and cons. And then this can be difficult because it requires acceptance of reality for what it is right now. So I'm upset. So I need to know, I'm, I need to not uh, say that this, I don't want this to happen. Of course you don't want it to happen, but when we say I sh this should not happen, that's often a sign of non-acceptance. Acceptance means it is what it is and let me, breathe through it. So just paying attention to the breathing can help us get through. It's, it's part of accepting the moment from, for what it is. Half smiling is what we call where what we do in half smiling is to relax the face while bringing up the situation that is upsetting, smiling gently to it. You know, meaning just in a way it's kind of accepting that this is happening and this is life and 
smiling to it mm. in that moment. I know some people are like, what's that a smile about? <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's just, and if, if that happens, well, not the strategy for you. But if you can you know, relax one's face and smile to it, that would be great. You know? the, uh, and then awareness of the present moment, just what's going on right now, not, not down the road. What's happening right now? You know, o around me, um, no one's harming me. You know, it's just what being aware of all the things that are happening outside what is right now and not down the road. M most of the time we worry about things that are going to happen that may not happen. But if we bring our attention back to the here and now, the worry may go down. So again, focusing and mindfulness practices is very effective and helpful. Any questions about strategies? I mean, there are lots out there, and uh, you know, be creative and come up with those general principles of what you can do. Okay. All right, so the last section is, what can you do if you have a family member who uh, has the urges or has the, the old ways of, of coping by, through self-injury? Really important, understand that this behavior is an attempt to maintain control, and it is a way of self-soothing, meaning this is a way that they have learned to cope. It's not something, it causes harm, yes, for sure, but understand that that's what they know right now and be understanding and compassionate that you know, they haven't learned otherwise. Uh, let the person know that you care and that you will listen non-judgmentally. Really important to, to try to be non-judgmental. And if you notice that you, there, you, you're judging or there are judgmental thoughts, um, just notice that. Don't put yourself down for it because it, is, it can be frustrating. Um, and don't judge yourself for judging, if we, we, as we say. Um, just w w and one way that we can get replace judgment is to be compassionate, is to imagine if I were in this person's shoes, what would that be like for me? In my moments of desperation, you know, what is that like? And so try to listen and see what are the underlying reasons for why they're doing this. Is it to relieve anxiety, to relieve guilt? Is it to punish themselves? Um, is it to change the relationship between um, you and your loved one? There's some other reason there that you want to listen for. And then when you're asking for them to change their behavior, make sure that you, you can validate and understand their actions, thoughts, and feelings. So important. You know, it's, I'm more likely to change if I know that you are in my corner as opposed to judging me, right? Um, have you ever gone home and uh, you've had a frustrating day at work uh, and uh, all you want to do is just to talk to your partner about what an awful day and stressful day you've had and all you want is this person to say, yeah, I, I know how that feels or you know, it must be awful to have such a day versus someone who says, well, if you don't like your job, why don't you change it? Why don't you go look for another job? Right. That's not, that's the last thing you want to hear. Or even though you may think that, you're less likely to do that if you, th you, you, if you think that this person is trying to make you different or change or control you. But if the person feels like, hey, you truly understand my experience, I'm more likely to go along with your suggestions. So always validate first, make sure that you understand that experience before asking the person to make some changes. And then allow the person to express their feelings. And it's not easy to listen to people's distress, but sometimes you don't have to do anything with those feelings, but just to validate and say, and just be, be a witness to that can be so powerful, can be so, and I oftentimes discovered in my work is sometimes just being there opens up this space for people to make changes for themselves. They come up with their own ideas because they don't feel judged, right? They no longer have to react to people's judgment and criticalness. They now can feel safe that you're in their corner and then all kinds of creative things happen. So it's amazing how we can just be with that person and we're doing something for that person already. Um, and then coach skillful behaviors. All these ideas you've just written down, offer them, offer them, offer them. Uh, have the person also think up, what can you do? What different thing can you do? So that you don't make it worse. Yeah. Cheer on and reward the use of alternative coping. So, pom-poms, I always love this image. You know, have pom-poms, yay, wonderful job, good thing, wonderful. Let's keep going, you know, just be encouraging. And respect and communicate your personal limits. You know, again, respecting yourself that th this may be difficult for you and you're not willing to tolerate this. You have the, the right to do that. 
because sometimes that can also help the person know that these are the limits within my house. And you can do that in a, in a compassionate, kind way too. You know, it doesn't have to be harsh or uh, judgmental. It can be done in a very compassionate way, out of a space of caring that, you know, um, uh, th this makes the house unsafe if you did this. Right? So set those limits, allow yourself those limits. And then if the person needs a, a therapist, um, by all means, call us, I'll call the crisis line, you know, and we'll do our best to help. Yeah. So any questions, any thoughts, anything you'd like to um, share? Mm -hmm. no. Yes. In terms of trying to help people with the best, if they're having difficulty tolerating uh, their state and handling self harm behaviors, I'm assuming it's better to try to talk to them and develop other options, like you've outlined here, before they're in that state, or if people are already about to cut, when's the best time, I guess, to plan to help other people with other options instead okay. of self -harm? So what, what I hear from the question is, how do you help people to nip it in the bud before it gets worse, before they, they get to such a state that it, it, they, they, the urge to harm themselves is so strong? Certainly being attentive and being attuned to where they're at, checking into how they're feeling, uh, how things are for them. I mean, you know, if, if someone is, if you know the person so well, Live, who live with you and you know the person well, you, you sometimes can see signs of that, right? Um, uh, sudden behaviors, changes. Um, you may want to check in with the person. How are things? You know, is something happening here? Um, um, ask the person what could be done, you know, not to let it go down that road where it gets more and more intense. Maybe using some of these self-soothing strategies ahead of time can, be, can prevent the downward spiral. Uh, and also help them to notice for themselves what are the initial signs, what are the stresses outside of them that could, uh, when, that could get them to this state of um, wanting to harm themselves. So that lo looking at the initial warning signs for themselves, everyone is different. Um, so yeah, yeah, so the more you know the person, the, the, the more likely and the easier it is for you to know uh, what this person's uh, danger signs are. Okay. I think it's important to be consistent as well. If you're the person offering the help, mm -hmm. make sure that they, they know and they understand that you're there for them. Ah, good point. So the, the, the comment was consistency is very important as much as we can um, because you won't, that allows the person to see you as more predictable. They know what to expect. And if they know what to expect, stress, they, they feel less stressed. So you can be the, um, the safe base, I guess, when you can be consistent. Um, the reality is we are not always, and we can't always be. So when that doesn't happen, then um, you can talk about that or to explain why that is. But uh, as a general principle, for sure, consistency is very helpful, very helpful. Mm, and when there's not consistency, we can help people cope with inconsistency because life is like that, right? You, things happen. Um, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. This isn't really a question. This is more of a comment. It's very difficult to know how much you should be present with the person mm -hmm. and how much space to give them mm. to be alone. And they won't harm themselves while they're with you, but you can't be with somebody 24-7. Yes. Um, when they're on their own, will they go and get something done, you know, to spite you, really, while you're yes. watching them? Yes. Yes. Exactly. So that's a great question. So how much can you be there all the time, and when do you know to, to um, let the person figure it out and, and, and be more independent that way? Would that mm -hmm. capture a little bit? One of the ideas that uh, have been helpful and um, that people do talk about is our job is not to actually, most of the time, when, when someone is in distress, to actually physically, well, metaphorically, pick the person up. We want to, to get down to the person's level and be supportive, validating, being empathic and compassionate, and offer solutions so that the person can get back up himself or herself. You, you may offer a hand that the person can take and help, but you don't literally go there and pick the person up. So it's a very different space, right? That it can, 
it, it allows the person to learn to be self-sufficient and independent and figure things out while you're still there. You haven't abandoned the person. I'm still here, but somehow we, you and I, we have to figure out how to do this together. But it doesn't help for me to actually kind of uh, do it for you because then you won't learn how to do it for yourself when I'm not here or when I'm out shopping or when I'm doing this. So that's the, the general frame or approach. And uh, there's a book called uh, Stop Walking on Eggshells that can be helpful uh, to know, to establish your own limits and, and, and so that you're not always kind of having to tiptoe, you know, what is, is what I'm going to say going to make the person uh, cut themselves or burn themselves? I forget the author, but it's called Stop Walking on Eggshells. And there's also a workbook too. Yes. So they may say, oh, because you do this, I'm going to cut. But it's not. Yeah. And that's the ultimate. Yeah. And it can be hard when you, you, you care so much for the person, but in the end, we want to help the person be able to help himself or herself. You know? And we'd also, you know, when we take responsibility for people who harm themselves, we are treating them like little kids, right? Not as adults, you know? And they resent you. And they can reason, and yes, and in, in a way, I like to see that it's quite insulting, you know, even though the, I'm not sure how the person experiences it, but I like to see you as a, a, an adult. Yes, there are problems, but let's figure this out, but not to treat the person like a, a child. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Yeah. Okay, if not, thank you very much for your attention and your contribution and your participation and your attendance to come here.